Hey everyone, it's Matthias. So today I'm sitting down with Garrett Conley, the author of Boy Erased, which is a memoir of his experiences growing up gay within rural Arkansas uh, as the son of a missionary Baptist pastor, uh, and then his experiences going through conversion therapy or ex-gay therapy uh, when he was in college. This is a very timely conversation as conversion therapy has recently popped back up in the news on account of the Republican National Convention uh, and their proposal to add a uh, plank in their platform around conversion therapy. Uh, so without further ado, here's my conversation with Garrett. <laughs> Hey, Garrett. Hi. Thank you so much for being willing to do this. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. Yeah. Uh, so you just recently released a book, Boy Erased. Um, for people who haven't read it yet or don't know or aren't familiar with it, um, could you just give me a brief summary of it, brief summary of your story? Um, sure. Yeah. So it's basically like an account of my time in ex-gay therapy, which is more popularly known as conversion therapy. Uh, it was in it took place in Memphis, Tennessee, but the book also charts sort of my uh, emotional development leading up to that mm -hmm. as well. So my father was a missionary Baptist preacher. Um, all of the ideas that currently exist in conversion therapy already existed in the culture when I was growing up. So like I always say, like nothing was surprising. Right. It just felt like a natural occurrence to have it all concentrated in one place so that's sort of what the book deals with yeah yeah, yeah. and it's great I, I mean I've read it um, <laughs> I read it all in a single day and yeah. I mean, it tells it tells a story that I, I never went through like official conversion therapy but all of that theology all of that work worked its way into my family and yep. it's just such a familiar story to so many LGBT people who've grown up within like religious households. Um, and yeah, that, that's what I always say when people are shocked about yeah. conversion therapy because like a lot of my tour people would be like, I can't believe that was 2004. Right. And I always say, well, I mean, can we believe the statistics about LGBTQ youth homelessness, which is 40% of all homeless youth? Right. Um, can we believe the fact that like, you know, this language still exists today? And you know, I always say you don't have to go through conversion therapy to go through conversion therapy. Exactly. Like, just yeah. grow up in a household like that. Right. It's yeah. disturbing. And and you're right. Like, it still exists today. Like, <laughs> I mean, just this week, like, Ugh. the Republican National <laughs> Convention, like, Tony Perkins, the president yep. of American <laughs> Family Association, like, introduced this plank in the, in the yeah. platform to encourage conversion therapy and well yeah and cnn reported that the language was actually much more oriented toward conversion therapy and that um the republican national convention asked him to sort of dial it back a little wow so apparently it was even more like direct but now it, he did argue for the inclusion of the word therapy mm. so there's no other there, there's no other way to interpret that right statement really yeah, yeah. It's it's mind blowing to me that in 2016, like the national platform mm -hmm. of a major political party would be encouraging this. I mean, I'm getting my master's in psychology. Like, I know. I mean, <laughs> please explain work. to me what's like, going on. <laughs> <laughs> it's just my yeah. It's just, I think mind blowing is the only way to describe it. Yeah, like, I mean. I grew up in a fundamentalist household, and I still don't understand why the timing is the way it is right now. Right. Like, I cannot understand why this would have passed in right. any way. Yeah. Like, it's like, it just seems insane. It is. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. It's, it's scary. It's really scary. Yeah, especially, you know, I don't know if you read this, but um, most of the former ex-gay leaders... Uh, denounced this move as well. They said, like, it doesn't work. Right. Um, even John Smith, the guy who ran the conversion therapy camp where I went, um, he was like, this isn't working, obviously. Yeah. He's married to a man now. Right. I mean, how else, like, I don't know how many places have to condemn conversion therapy before people pay attention. Right. 
And it, it makes me wonder if people want to pay attention. Like, I, could, I think about, like, Alan Chambers, who mm-hmm. um, was the leader of Exodus. And <laughs> I, I mean, I interviewed him last year when his book came out. But okay. he's adamant. He's like, 99.9% of the people who went through Exodus over the 40 years that it was in existence did not experience any kind of change. I want to know that point 0.1%. Right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I want to interview them because I don't. I think their story would break down. <laughs> yeah, I do too. I mean, yeah, it just. Uh, and yet, I mean, the moment he said that, people started to discredit him, and you know, he was this leader, and now yeah. no one will listen to him anymore because uh, he doesn't fit this agenda. Yeah, I. I mean, I think part of that, and this is sort of getting off topic for a second, but I think part of that is that these ex-gay leaders often seem as though they're capitalizing off of their experience. Mm. Like, you know, the stories of the survivors are what actually need to be told. Absolutely. Not the stories of people who are, like, sort of transitioning into um, believing that they were wrong. Like, I mean, sure, we need that narrative, Mm -hmm. but maybe publishers should focus on other stories first. It's like when John Smith wrote his vanity memoir, X'd Out, Mm. Which is like it was like a self published memoir, oh, and gosh. it's just the most disturbing. I mean, you know, I feel for that man mm-hmm. in some ways, but you know, we don't need to see that first. Mm. Like, and I feel like, like you said, like maybe people aren't listening because these people are discrediting themselves as well. Right. I mean, I wish that people like Alan Chambers and John Smith would just spend the rest of their lives apologizing without explaining. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, like, just, right. sorry, I killed so many people. Right. Um, this is horrible. Let's talk about it. Right. Like, but, you know, I think there's no easy way to transition into sort of telling these stories. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because um, the damage is astronomical. Yeah. And... And I, I think... Yeah, go ahead. No. Well, I think also, like, you know, ex gay therapy, conversion therapy has always been treated as a joke in popular culture. Right. Like, there was an SNL skit with Ben Affleck that was pretty funny, but, you know, and then there was But I'm a Cheerleader, which is that movie about, um, like, with RuPaul in it, about right. an ex gay therapy facility. And it's always been sort of like, I mean, even I think on the latest season of Kimmy Schmidt, there was a joke about it, and then, like, there was a joke in Orange is the New Black, and it's just always a joke. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's hard for liberals in our country to take it seriously. That, right. like, when somebody like Perkins says something like this, um, I think people are just like, whoa, he's just crazy. Right. You know? Or, like, they're, but now that it's elevated to the status of like being a platform, <laughs> like, that, I mean, hopefully people will start paying attention. Because that kills lives. Mm-hmm. Like, there's no other way of understanding it. Right. Like, yeah. I and, don't know. Yeah, and I think, I mean, and your your book does such a good job of like kind of exposing what goes on beneath it. And the number of people I've recommended the book to have read it, and like you've said, have been shocked by it. Yeah, of it's course. Like, I mean, and like you said, it's not shocking to any of us who have been through mm-hmm. it. It's like a, this is this is what happens. This is the theology of a majority of the conservative church Mm -hmm. uh, or a good portion of it anyway. And well, I think like there's a lot of complacency with liberals in terms of LGBTQ rights Mm -hmm. um, because it's easy to just see progress, you know, like instead of seeing what still exists on the ground level, Mm -hmm. um, like I said, like, LGBTQ homelessness, which is at epidemic rates, um, or, you know, anything else that has to do with being a queer individual in our society today, Mm -hmm. which, you know, like people pay attention for two seconds. It enters the news cycle with Orlando. Right. And then it's like almost forgotten. Mm -hmm. And it's really confusing to me that that continues to happen over and over again, except for the fact that it seems like we forget everything in our country. <laughs> like, I mean, this is true, yeah. Police brutality, like, we'll, we'll read about it, we'll be shocked for a second, right? and, you know, we'll move on to the next n- news item. Yeah, yeah. And it's just, I don't know, I don't know what it's going to take for this to stick in people's consciousness. Yeah, I don't know either. And, 
and to see the direction that we're going. Mm-hmm. It, I, like, I mean, yeah, I said it's scary. Like, mm, and with Mike Pence being nominated, who yeah, is, right. like, well, so anti-LGBT. Like, <laughs> I have some of his language here, because I've just been trying to write an article on it. Yeah. Um, it's insane. Uh, so he, he wants, like, I think in t- 2000, but he still sort of believes this stuff, um, he basically said that all HIV treatment was needy, that it was like we shouldn't prioritize it because it helps people live like decadent lifestyles. Gosh. And then he instead supported, quote, those institutions which provide assistance to those seeking to change their sexual behavior, which, okay. Yeah. Um, and this is a guy who, like, I mean, I can't even name the dozens of things that he's done against LGBT people. Right. There are lists out there. Yeah, there are <laughs> lists. I found, like, five of them today. They like, yeah. were, like, published in the last five hours. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Oh, God. And yet, and- Trump is still trying to tell us that he's good for us. And... Well, uh, I've never seen a man with so many scandals to his name right. get away with so much. And yet, we've got, like, Hillary Clinton's email scandal. Right. It's, like... It's like <laughs> lowered her ratings down so much and you're like wait we just talked about how trump university was actually a scam right like nobody cares about that yeah <laughs> it's like what is going on i just yeah i just don't understand <laughs> well i guess number one she's a woman and in a yeah. country people don't like women right so. I and mean, it's true it's yeah true. Ugh, we can have a like red-faced idiot man right but not like a highly qualified woman. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. completely insane. Yeah, it is insane. Yeah. So, for people who are watching this who are convinced, who are skeptical, who are hearing us talk as being part of a liberal machine, like, yeah. I mean, I think some of my blog audience, some of the people who watch this are coming from that perspective. Yeah. Uh, if someone's genuinely wanting to learn more, like, what would you recommend? I mean, besides reading your book, <laughs> that's what I usually do. But, yeah. I mean, for people who are who are not convinced but are curious about this, who are wondering about this, like... Well, I mean, you know, usually when I'm talking to audiences, I'm much more careful than this. Like, I'm not, like, I'm not talking one-on-one with someone that I know, like, often shares some of my ideas. Right. And so what I would say is there's unequivocal evidence that something like conversion therapy, no matter what your stance on LGBTQ rights is today, is extremely harmful. And I think most of the religious community agrees with this. Um, And the reason that they agree with this is that the practices have no basis in, like, biblical understandings and no basis in uh, any, like, actual psychological therapeutic practices right. because I mean I'll list a few things that they made me do which I hope that most of your audience would think is at least counterintuitive right um, I mean I had to look at my family tree and I had to draw every member of my family and beside their names I had to place what were called sin symbols hmm. so I had to look at their names and think okay what sins do I know that they committed? Mm. And so, you know, if someone committed adultery, it would be AD next to their name. If someone had a gambling problem, it would be a dollar sign. And from that, we were so, supposed to sort of add up all of those symbols and then look at our name at the bottom and put an H next to it for homosexuality. Mm. And that was supposed to tell us why we were there, which, yes, the yeah. Bible does talk about the sins of the fathers. Right. Um, but to take it to this literal level in which, like, we're mixing a genogram, which is an actual, like, common right. practice, yeah. um, with these things called sin symbols into almost a mathematical formula mm-hmm. goes against what everything that I know about compassion mm-hmm. in the New Testament. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Jesus does speak out against people, but also... He doesn't do so in this like extremely formulaic way, right? Um, and and it feels like this strange blend of 
modern practices or at least like 1960s era practices right. um, and like Freudian psychology mm -hmm. and um, abuse narratives mm -hmm. and like you know in the early Freudian psychology everyone sort of blamed everyone everyone's parents for everything right. that happened yeah um, and you know there's enough of that going around in the LGBTQ community yeah. so like my you know the first thing a parent often says to a child when they find out is what did I do wrong right right and so these places are actually confirming that idea for these parents and these children in order to, I believe, um, whether or not they meant to do this or not, in order to incite hatred mm -hmm. for your parents. Mm -hmm. There was an activity where I had to sit across from an empty chair and imagine my father in it, and I had to scream at this empty chair with my mm -hmm. father in it and tell him how much I hated him. Mm -hmm. and I, I refused to do that. Yeah. But, but because I refused to do that, they considered me to be more sinful and not ready to learn the message. And I would, I would say to anyone who believes in compassion mm -hmm. or in Jesus' understanding of compassion, no matter where you are right. on, on the issue, mm -hmm. that is not what compassion looks like. And if you believe that's what compassion looks like, I would suggest maybe reading the New Testament again. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I don't mean to be preachy, but like, right. you know, I really don't care whether or not a, another human being, I mean, I do on some levels, but I don't care whether or not another human being agrees with all my political stances. Right. Like, I know I'm far left. I'm always going to be because of who I am. Me too. <laughs> but I also respect others' differences. It's right. when people will not allow me to live, mm -hmm. that's when I can't respect their they're diff I can't respect Donald Trump. I can't respect Perkins or Pence. Right. Like, I, you know, I'm sure they've done some things. I'm not sure. I think maybe they could have done some things that were good in the past. Right. <laughs> um, but, like, you know, they need to get educated. Yeah. These are their constituents they're dealing with. These are people's lives. Right. It's not just a talking point. Right. It's going to earn you some points. Yeah. Um, mm. Yeah, I mean, sorry, I got off on that. No, but it's, I mean, it's true. It's absolutely true. Yeah, because I mean, I just, you know, I've I've lived with my parents on and off each summer when I come back. Mm -hmm. I used to live in Bulgaria, so I would come back in the summers. Mm -hmm. And I did that on purpose because I wanted to remember where they came from. And I wanted to remember, um, you know, where I came from and mm -hmm. where I am now. Mm -hmm. And I think that that leveled me in some ways because my father and I would just have all of these deal theological discussions right. about the Bible, and I respected him mm -hmm. for what they were. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, he doesn't continue to preach against me. Mm -hmm. He he will talk about, like, if someone asks him where his stance is, he'll say, well, I don't really support it, but I love those people. Right. Those people. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, that's progress for that me. That is progress. And I think that that's what many of your viewers may be at right now mm -hmm. where they're like I don't understand it I don't believe it mm -hmm. but I'm not going to openly hate someone or send them into conversion therapy where they'll, there's like a high percentage that they'll commit suicide right like yeah. we don't need any of that we don't yeah. <laughs> this is true this is true yeah yeah mm. well thank you so much for yeah doing this and for your words and yeah yeah thanks we, for the great questions and for course. having me on yeah mm. yeah yeah, everyone go pick up a copy of his book. It's yeah. amazing. It's available <laughs> everywhere. So, Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So Boy Race is available everywhere where books are sold. I would recommend go getting a copy right away, sitting down, reading it. Uh, if you have been through conversion therapy or ex-gay therapy, be aware it is a very difficult read. Um, I sobbed through it. Um, it was very, very hard to read, but but so good. Make sure you subscribe to my channel so you don't miss out on more conversations like this. We have some great ones coming up within the next couple months. Uh, have a good day.